On August the 26th, 1928, May Donahue, a Glasgow shop assistant of modest means but much determination, passed by this magnificent town hall in Paisley, Scotland, on what was to become the most celebrated journey in modern legal history. May Donahue's immediate destination was the Well Meadow Cafe, a tea shop at 1 Well Meadow Street in downtown Paisley, operated by Francis Minkella. But May Donahue's 30 minute tram ride there from her tenement home in Glasgow was to prove the start of a much longer and truly momentous journey. It would take her to the House of Lords in London, there to unlock forever those vaulted chambers of the legal mind where lay in timeless slumber all the undiscovered categories of negligence. For lawyers throughout the Commonwealth common law world, May Donahue's triumph in the House of Lords was to be the start of an even longer journey, a journey through Lord Tennyson's mist-shrouded wilderness of single instances in search of new standards of acceptable conduct between members of a civilized society. The end of that journey is not yet in sight. Have you ever heard of the case of Donahue versus Stevenson? No. No, I haven't I? No? The murder or? Uh... Never heard of it, but it sounds awful. I've never heard the end of my book. No, I've never heard of it. Donahue and Stevenson about the ginger, the snail in the ginger beer bottle. I think everybody knows that. The snail in the ginger beer bottle, wasn't it? Yes, it's a long time ago. When May Donahue left her brother's home at 49 Kent Street in the heart of Glasgow, she probably headed across London Road, down Greendike Street, past the Justiciary Courts, over the Clyde by the Albert Bridge to the Gorbals, and so through the countryside which is now taken up by the busy suburbs of Belhouston and Cardonald to the ancient borough of Paisley. She was the one who drank the beer, but she didn't buy it. It was ginger beer, surely. That's she right. Was a, she was a good... Uh, it's a ginger beer bottle. Yeah. Church of Scotland, yeah. Yes, yes. But she, but she didn't buy it. She didn't buy it. She, she, it. Buy she, it. Buy she it. had, she may have had a, a casing contract. And her lover bought it. Mm. Her lover? Yeah. Now, that doesn't appear from the Scottish law report. It's the sort of thing one didn't talk about in those days, presumably. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> no, but it was a third party. It was her husband or a, her lover who bought it. I think lovers are much better bet. Yeah, probably. It's more interesting anyway. No doubt she alighted in front of the Thomas Coates Memorial Church, a few paces from the small building at the corner of High Street, Lady Lane and Well Meadow Street, which housed Mr. Mingella's cafe. When she took her seat here, May Donahue is said to have been with a friend. Of the identity of this mysterious person, we know only one thing that Lord Macmillan refers in his speech in the House of Lords to Mrs. Donahue's companion as she, echoing perhaps a reference made during argument. It was her friend, that unknown soldier on the common law roll of honor, who is said to have given the short order that would change the course of legal history. 
I find it very, very difficult to understand how you can get a major case in law through a bottle of ginger beer and a slug. In the first place, the slug's been in the bottle for what? A week? A fortnight? Ten days? It's obviously dead. It's well pickled. It's not going to give anybody gastric enteritis or bugger all. I said, and that is the honest opinion of a blacksmith. <laughs> Is this a wind-up case or what? I mean, come on. <laughs> I think you put snail in a ginger beer bottle. Give me a break. You're not conning me. This a con, is it? I'll be right, man. Never heard that. You're choking, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> she should have probably ate the snail. This is some sort of a transcontinental Canadian joke, right? <laughs> There are those who say that May Donahue's story of misadventure in Well Meadow Street was simply a hoax, that it belongs to the rich heritage of Scottish legal mythology. There was a story that the snail was planted because uh, she was in uh, impoverished circumstances and was actually looking for an excuse to, to make a fortune. Lord Norman, who was counsel for David Stevenson, is said to have been of this belief. The Lord Norman came down and sat at the table I had been dining at. He was a tall, kindly old Scot. And we fell to talking about Donoghue and Stevenson. And he said, boys, he said, that case was a hoax. It was an issue of law thought up by a group of Scottish advocates who had nothing better to do in the depression. And then he went on to explain that there never really was a snail in the bottle, the case had never come to trial, and that it had been settled. And I really wish that I had known more about the case then. I was very green and had been able to engage him in conversation and a little cross-examination about what he meant about that. It would have been fascinating. Lord Norman is a judge of the very highest repute. I don't think for a minute that he would have ventured an opinion like that uh, to anybody unless he sincerely believed it to be the case. And um, all I can say is if they did, if they did uh, invent the circumstances, you know, they did a very good job of invention because they, it, it clearly made an arguable case uh, in the Court of Session in the House of Lords uh, with quite dramatic results as it happened. You know. According to her pleadings, at approximately 8.50pm that evening, May Donahue's friend is said to have ordered for her ice cream and ginger beer the Scottish ice cream float. Mr. Mingella is said to have brought the ice cream in a tumbler and to have poured on it some ginger beer from a brown opaque bottle bearing the name D. Stevenson, Glen Lane, Paisley. It is said that after May Donahue had taken a drink and while her friend was refilling her glass, she saw floating out of the bottle what she believed to be the partly decomposed remains of a snail. May Donahue said she was made ill by what she had consumed and what she thought she had seen. She is said to have had medical treatment three days later on August the 29th, 1928, from her doctor, and on September 16th, 1928, three weeks later, at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Because May Donahue had not purchased the ginger beer herself, she had no contract with anyone. She would have to prove negligence if she was to recover. Francis Mingella had not been negligent. He hadn't filled the bottle. He couldn't know what was in it. The only person she could sue for negligence was David Stevenson, the manufacturer. What would you do if you found a snail in a ginger beer? <laughs> well, it depends what the snail was like. I'd be sick, I might be mad at the man. I'd go over and shout at him. I'd take it out. There's not very many calories in it. Well, I would first ask myself whether the uh, snail had any nutritional value, right? And if I decided that it didn't, right, then I, I probably would, I would go to sue the company, yeah. If there's any in the bottle, it shouldn't be there. You bloody will claim it and hope for the best you get something. May Donahue learned the law from a remarkable Glasgow solicitor 
and city councillor, Mr. Walter Leachman. Well, Walter Leachman must have been a very determined solicitor indeed, with a great uh, principle behind him, driving him on uh, in the light of the laws that then stood. Um, if you had asked anyone for an opinion as to the possibility of this case ever succeeding in light of the law as it stood, and indeed in the appeal court in Scotland, 99 times out of 100 you would have been told to forget it. Walter Leachman, I have to say, uh, was the Don Quixote of the legal profession at that time. He embarked on a case uh, for a woman with no means at all and took it all the way to the House of Lords. For Leachman to do it, it was really an act of great faith and uh, he, he, more than anybody else, is responsible for the creation of Donahue v. Stevenson. Walter Leachman issued her writ against Mr. Stevenson. It described the Stevenson plant as a place where snails and the slimy trails of snails were frequently found, and it claimed 500 pounds damages and costs. There are a lot of those gastropods in Scotland. It's a very wet country. I hadn't realized. You wonder, how does a snail get in there? Where do they find these snails? But when you walk around Scotland, there are millions of snails. It's wet everywhere all of the time. It's raining. So uh, I'm surprised there aren't hundreds of these cases where snails have crawled into various articles. Could I have a glass of ginger beer, please? Sorry, sir. We don't serve it. Too many snails. Do you eat snails? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, as, a matter, as a matter of fact, yeah, I have. I like snails, yes. I love snails. I eat them as often as I can, um, with garlic butter, you know. Anyhow, I mean, I love them. <laughs> um, I'm not keen on ginger beer, mind you. <laughs> so it's funny, I wouldn't like the thought of a slug in a bottle of bottled by ginger beer, but I do like a scar going. I just like the taste of it. But like with any meat, when I'm eating it, I don't think where it's come from. <laughs> What's the special here tonight? We have uh, escargot straight from Scotland. Has anyone ever found any ginger beer and there are snails here? <laughs> In due course, Stevenson's counsel moved the Court of Session to dismiss this claim on the grounds that it disclosed no cause of action. They failed at first instance before the Lord Ordinary, Lord Moncrief, but succeeded three to one in the second division. The majority of the Scottish appeal judges followed a recent decision of their own in two cases brought by plaintiffs who claimed to have found a mouse in a bottle of ginger beer, Mullinan Bar and McGowanan Bar. But someone said they found a mouse in a bottle. Well, no one could possibly say that they hadn't found it. Because if you were against theirs and you never looked at it at the same time, but from our experience of human nature, uh, there's a lot of people who are going to think it's a way of making money to find something in the bottle that shouldn't be there. Then, of course, if you're in business, it's bad publicity to have a complaint against you. It's brought up the courts, so sometimes you pay just to shut them up. I can give you an example of that. There was a woman came in to our Glasgow works once to complain about something. I don't know what it was. It was a funny taste or something like that. And an uncle of mine said, oh, away you go, woman. There's ten bob. Are you quite satisfied? Oh, yes. The next morning, there was ten women outside at the office door waiting for their ten bobs. It was too good a way of making money. You'd have had, as I say, people queuing up with Dozens of mice, you know, not just one, but a sort of family of mice all waving at you as they came out. The judges declared that the only difference between those cases and May Donahue's was the difference between a rodent and a gastropod, and that this, according to the law of Scotland, amounted to no difference at all. Zoologists, on the other hand, throughout Scotland, reject this view. Well, the fairly major differences between gastropods and rodents. Rodents belong to a, a totally different uh, category of animal. They're furry and they, they feed their young with milk. Um, in that case, they're much closer to human beings than, than a slug is. What's the difference between a gastropod and a rodent? 
Uh, teeth. The Scottish judges declared that the manufacturer of such products owed no duty of care to an ultimate consumer unless there was a contract between them requiring such care, a most unlikely thing. If you can imagine a prisoner tied up where, where he cannot escape, he's tied by his, by his hands and he's tied by his feet, that was the way people were as far as the, <clears throat> the law of contract and negligence was concerned before this case of Donoghue v. Stevenson. It really unloosed the cords of uh, uh, the prisoner, so to speak, and brought in the new concept of neighbourhood and broadened the whole area of responsibility which people had had towards their fellow citizens. People injured by products couldn't sue the manufacturers of those products even though they were negligent, they were limited only to the person who sold it to them who wasn't at fault at all and I think that was terribly unfair. Stevenson's counsel uh, argued that there was no uh, steel in the bottle but it, in fact said in any event it was not the responsibility of the bottlers, it was the responsibility of the cafe owner. And that was the aspect of the case that went to the House of Lords. The steel became irrelevant after a while because uh, the whole issue then was who would be responsible. A perusal of the Scottish session cases discloses the first reason why it must be said that fate had ordained for May Donoghue a place of honor in the cavalcade of legal history. The reports show not only that Walter Leachman's firm had acted for the unsuccessful pursuers in the mouse cases, but also that he caused May Donoghue's writ to be issued less than three weeks after the appeal decision in the mouse cases was handed down. If Mr. Leachman had not had May Donoghue's case on the back burner, so to speak, who knows for how long the law might have remained as the court of session had declared it in the mouse cases. How lucky for Mrs. Donoghue, how lucky for all of us, that she not only consulted the only lawyer who would have taken her case, but would have taken it to the highest court in the land. May Donahue's journey to that last tribunal cannot have been an easy one. Not only had counsel to be retained who were willing to act without reward, but May Donahue had to gain for herself the status of a pauper, for there was no way that she could have put up security for costs. The progress of May Donahue's petition to be allowed to appear in former pauperis is recorded in the Lord's journals. It was supported by an affidavit in which she swore. That I am very poor and am not worth in all the world the sum of five pounds, my wearing apparel and the subject matter of the said appeal only excepted, and am, by reason of such my poverty, unable to prosecute the said appeal. And so it came to pass, nine months later, on December 10th, 1931, in a committee room of the House of Lords, overlooking the gardens beside the Thames where tea is served, that five law lords, dressed as is their custom in ordinary suits, sat to hear argument in May Donahue's case. Among these law lords was Lord Atkin of Abadovy, one of the two leading figures of English law in this century. The other is Lord Denning. I knew Lord Atkin well. Small, not tall at all, but very acute mind. He was very, very clever and able and industrious. And in a way, he took the greatest pains, of course, over his judgments. He always read all the papers beforehand. He, oh, I think he'd always made up his mind beforehand. May Donahue's counsel wisely rested her case on very narrow ground. A manufacturer who puts on the market an article intended for human consumption 
in a form which precludes the possibility of examination, they contended, must be liable to the consumer for any damage caused by want of reasonable care to ensure its fitness for consumption. Let us examine the Stevenson bottle closely. It is made of glass completely impenetrable to the human eye. And that's what led up to the various cases of people discovering some deleterious matter in the bottle. Because there was no way you could see through the bottle to know whether it was there or not when you sold it. There was no way unless you changed your manufacturing methods, for you could avoid being sued by a dozen people every day who just came up and said, I found a couple of tarantulas or mice in a bottle of ginger beer. There's no defense against that. Mr. Normand, who was counsel for David Stevenson, laid emphasis on the wisdom of the Scottish appeal judges. Mr. Norman made an always potent point. The duty contended for, he said, if it were to be affirmed, would be affirmed now for the first time. What Mr. Norman may not have known was that Lord Atkin's mind had for some time been directed to a larger but closely related theme. And here lies further evidence that May Donahue's case was indeed directed by the hand of fate. Lord Atkin had been addressing his mind to the parable of the Good Samaritan and the confluence of law and morality. It so happens that the parable is illustrated in marble on the pulpit of the magnificent Thomas Coates Memorial Church, which stands immediately opposite the site of the Well Meadow Cafe. A few months before May Donahue's case was decided in the House of Lords, Lord Atkin had given a lecture at King's College, London, in which he said this, The British law has always necessarily ingrained in it moral teaching in the sense that it lays down standards of honesty and plain dealing between man and man. He is not to injure his neighbour by acts of negligence and that certainly covers a very large field of the law. I doubt whether the whole of the law of tort could not be comprised in the golden maxim to do unto your neighbor as you would that he should do unto you. I doubt whether the whole law of tort could not be comprised in the golden maxim to do unto your neighbor as you would that he should do unto you. And so that great paragon of our Lord negligence, the good neighbor, born unheralded in Well Meadow Street on an August evening in 1928, came to be baptized quietly three years afterwards in the Strand in London. I've used that often. He founded it on the Christian precept. Start off, thou shalt not, thou shalt love thy neighbors as so, and watered it round a little bit to make it legal, thou shalt not injure your neighbor. And while I've often stressed that, it is strange that denunciating his principles, he did go back to the Christian precept. On May the 26th, 1932, Lord Atkin rose at last amid the splendor of the great chamber of the House of Lords. In his immortal speech in Donahue and Stevenson, Lord Atkin reminded the Lords of the law as it had previously been laid down. If one man is near to another, or near to the property of another, a duty lies on him not to do that which may cause a personal injury to that other, or may injure his property. Using the thoughts which he had expressed the previous autumn at King's College in London, Lord Atkin melded the previous law with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Neighborhood was a mental rather than a physical state. It would be enough to impose on David Stevenson a duty of care that those in the position of May Donahue ought to have been in his mind when bottling the ginger beer. She was his neighbor in spirit. Lord Atkin then stated his neighbor principle. 
you must take reasonable care to avoid acts or emissions which you can reasonably foresee would be likely to injure your neighbour. Who then, in law, is my neighbour? The answer seems to be persons who are so closely and directly affected by my act that I ought reasonably to have them in contemplation as being so affected when I am directing my mind to the acts or omissions which are called in question. Here was the golden maxim which he had mentioned at King's College, within which the whole law of torts could be comprised. And 16 pages further on, Lord Atkins states the principle on which his judgment rests. A manufacturer of products, which he sells in such a form as to show that he intends them to reach the ultimate consumer in the form in which they left him, and with no reasonable possibility of intermediate examination, and with the knowledge that the absence of reasonable care in the preparation or putting up of the products will result in an injury to the consumer's life or property, owes a duty to the consumer to take that reasonable care. For the first time, liability was established in the law of thought, when in fact there was no contractual obligations. It used to be thought, it used to be thought that such a liability as we now know it in Donoghue and Stevenson can only arise in the law of contract. And the House of Lords took the liberty of establishing for once that manufacturers of consumer products can be liable to anyone who may likely come in contact with their products. We were then directly responsible to the consumer, which we weren't before. So which is why we and other people just stopped these kind of bottles altogether and filled the ginger beer, brew ginger beer, into bottles that you could check were clean before you filled them, visually. Time has moved on since that decision took place way back in 1932. Uh, the principles of Donoghue v. Stevenson uh, as to the duties that we all owe to other uh, persons has been expanded into the various uh, areas of the law, the law of negligence itself, into the Factories Act, into consumer legislation, into occupier liability, into industrial tribunals and so on. The areas in which this case has affected their vast and too numerous dimension. And I go back to my basic point that this was a landmark decision. It introduced the general tort of negligence which had been not introduced into our law before. And that general law of negligence has swept up all the old things we had, action of trespass, acts on the case, and all that sort of thing, even swept up nuisance and everything. Prior to 1932, the law of negligence had evolved in a relatively haphazard and disorganized way. Uh, a number of relationships were recognized by the courts as setting up a duty of care and giving a remedy in negligence. But in 1932, in Lord Atkins' uh, judgment in Donahue and Stevenson, finally the law found itself drawing together the various strands and formulating a general principle, a principle that could be applied to any relationship in any set of circumstances subject to certain limits that were yet to be determined we had finally developed a general principle of law. It set loose in the world, uh, I think, a beautiful, noble idea that you must take care not to injure your neighbor. People who you can foresee will be injured by your conduct deserve protection, and you must behave cautiously and carefully. To me, that's a, a glorious idea, and so have the later courts. In all of these years since then, they've expanded that principle, utilized it thousands and thousands of times. The products liability principle in Donahue and Stevenson has proved capable of adaptation to the widest variety of situations in which damage of any sort is caused, personal injury, physical property damage, or pure economic loss. No one ever dreamt that it would apply to pure economic loss because all kinds of economic loss are foreseeable. You open a business, it's going to, to hurt 
the um, competition. And no one for a moment questioned that you had to cause the loss. That is, you would never be liable for what the law calls nonfeasance. That is, for a failure to act. Then the House of Lords, in a case called the Anne's decision, one of the judges, Lord Wilberforce, stated the Donahue and Stevenson principle as a general principle. You're liable for creating a foreseeable loss, whether it was to pure economic loss or for a failure to act. And that's like opening it up broadly so there are no limits to legal liability. What then of Lord Atkin's great neighbor principle, the idea which for more than 60 years has so gripped the imagination and perplexed the minds of lawyers the world over? The neighbor principle, considered in isolation, without regard for the large caveats which Lord Atkin so carefully placed on it, has of course been represented as a basis for imposing a duty of care in almost any case in which any sort of foreseeable loss is suffered by one person as a result of the action or inaction of another. It has been said by some to apply not only to cases of personal injury or physical damage to property, but also to cases in which there is no risk of either, cases involving loss only to pocket or estate. It has been said to apply to non-feasance and misfeasance alike. We've now opened it up and we've seen that this is a much more complex field than just physical injury and property damage, which is much more easy to circumscribe and to control. And when you get into the economic area, foresight may not be enough. There has to be something more. And what the great struggle now is to try and find ways of limiting this liability within reason uh, without destroying the basic concept, as I see it, which must survive and will survive. You must use reasonable care in all of your activities so as not to injure your neighbors. That's the importance of Donahue and Stevenson. It really introduced not only in Scots law, but more important still in English law, it introduced the concept of negligence, and it was Lord Macmillan who had the categories of negligence are never closed. And that sentence had as much impact as Atkins. What of free enterprise? What of automation, price competition, security realization, the allocation of capital and resources? Corporate takeovers, the vanishing corner store, the everlasting struggle for promotion, property and profit. How, they ask, can there be a duty to care gratuitously under such an economic system as ours for the economic interests of others in the absence of any inducement to reliance? One distinguished member of the House of Lords, not a law lord, is reputed to have observed the only way to make money is by taking it from other people. The High Court of Australia said the House of Lords in Anne's is wrong and we won't follow it. Canada, the uh, Supreme Court of Canada adopted the case and followed it. But then the, Supreme, the House of Lords recognized that they were unable to place any limits on pure economic loss or on a failure to act and when they recognized the results of that statement, restatement of Donahue and Stevenson, they said we were wrong and they actually overruled themselves. They reversed the Anne's decision and said it's no longer law. But in Canada, we're still following it. Surely Lord Atkin would be surprised, to say the least, at the confusion which has arisen between two of the principles he laid down in Donahue and Stevenson. His broad neighbor principle on the one hand, which seems applicable only to cases of personal injury and physical damage to property, and his product's liability principle on the other hand, based on deliberately induced reliance, which can be applied also to cases where the only damage 
is to pocket or estate. Perhaps it is this confusion between two essentially different principles that has served to keep May Donahue's case at the epicenter of seismic activity in the law of negligence. What conclusions can today's pilgrim draw from a nostalgic perambulation through downtown Paisley? In the first place, we find the two historic sites only 650 yards apart. Had David Stevenson played his bagpipes on that quiet August evening in the attic of his Glen Lane residence, May Donahue and Mr. Mingella could have danced to Strathspey in Wellmeadow Street. A physical relationship of proximity existed between these parties without the need of judicial invention. If that were so, a duty of care would have risen under the law as it had already stood. Can it be that the most famous decision of all time was really quite unnecessary? The Well Meadow Cafe has been gone for 40 years but see the tiny size of its site. If there were a snail, how could Francis Minghella not have known it? Would Mr. Leachman have advised the lawsuit if Mr. Minghella denied there was a snail? Surely here, at the birthplace of the doctrine of the good neighbor, the pilgrim thinks, we must decide anew what we really mean when we say that Donahue and Stevenson applies. Why is it then that May Donahue's case holds such an enduring fascination for lawyers the world over? The magnificent language of Lord Atkin the profound mysteries of the neighbor principle, the clash between the law lords. This is the stuff of legal history, the meeting of the common and civil law worlds, the collision between principles of contract and tort law that started 60 years of jurisprudential upheaval, the contrast of the sacred and mundane, splendor and poverty, the sublime and at least in the manner of its pleading, the slightly ridiculous. Surely there will never be such a case again. How could there ever be such a litigant again as that determined lady whose difficult life ended here at the Gartlock Institute, who was not worth five pounds in all the world, yet whose name has since become, in all the world, the cause of how many hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds and dollars changing hands. Is it because of the importance of the principles involved then, or in spite of them, that the people of May Donahue's case have their special place in our Hall of Fame. Lord Atkin and Lord Moncrief, May Donahue and her unidentified companion, David Stevenson and Francis Mingella, Walter Leachman and all the rest, what a wonderful company they make. If we smile when we speak of them now, it is because we believe they would smile too. We remember them when so many of their contemporaries, leaders of the bar, ornaments of the bench, are long forgotten, and it is they who have become the true immortals of our Lord.
pull the um, yeah, wait, the greenery we'll towards the slug that like you're trying to feed him. Like nice little slug. That's it. Yeah. Just wiggle it around a little bit to entice him. Come on, boy. <laughs> Great. Perfect. Thank you.